Gracious Heavenly Father, I come into your presence once again by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, so keenly aware of just how infinite that your word is and how precious that it is to us. And I just ask that you would take and filter out all of the error, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're continuing on in our study in Jude. This will be Jude Part 8, uh, verses 22 and 23. I've deliberately decided to focus in on just these two verses for this one video. It only seems fitting that we would come to this point, if you've followed us along in this series, that the Holy Spirit would be saying what He's going to say to us in the next couple of verses. We've been alerted by the Holy Spirit. The author of this epistle is the Holy Spirit. He's pointed out to us that we are His children, yet there are ungodly men that have crept in unawares whom God has ordained to condemnation. People don't want to think much about that, but that's just the plain, clear fact of the matter as stated in the text. And these turn the grace of God into lasc lasc I have a little trouble pronouncing lasciviousness. And they defile the flesh. They're filthy dreamers. They speak evil of dignitaries. They speak evil of those things which they don't understand, which they don't know. He calls them brute beasts. They corrupt themselves. They cause division. They're twice dead. That is, they died in Adam, but they were made alive in Christ. I know that that's not something that you're used to hearing, but in Christ all were made alive. And then as Paul says in Romans 7, I was once alive apart from the law, but when the law came in, when the commandment came, sin re revived and I died. So we died in our own sins. We can't blame Adam. So they're twice dead. They were never born again. We are not twice dead. We've been born again. But they are twice dead. They're no good at all for direction, like wandering stars. They can't be relied on. They're murmurers, and they complain about their situation and they speak great swelling words. And you don't have to look around very far to understand just what that is talking about. We were then exhorted by the Holy Spirit that we ought to remember that the Holy Spirit through the apostles has warned us that there would be such people. And we were told in verse 20 that we should build ourselves up we should listen to them not to these ones speaking great swelling words remember what they said through the apostles what the holy spirit said through the apostles and that we should build ourselves up in our most holy faith and i suggested to you that i believe that is the faithfulness of christ not our faith which I believe is God's faithfulness. Not our personal faith in God. Praying, worshiping in the Holy Spirit, which amounts to our directing our thoughts to the Word of God. Verse 21, keep yourselves in God's love, God's love for us. Uh, if you watched uh, my last video, I concentrated on His love for us. Keep yourself in God's love, not your love for Him, but His love for you. The problem with false doctrine is that it always diminishes the love of God. You know, He can't love anyone who lives like you. He can't love anyone that does the things that you do. And therefore, it's, it's works of the flesh, 
law, not grace. I remind you of Galatians 1, if any man bring any other gospel, let him be accursed. And I am alarmed, folks, I am, at, I am alarmed at how many people don't seem to know what the gospel is. The gospel is what Christ Jesus has done, not what you must do to receive what Christ has done. Please don't tell me that the gospel is, well, just Jesus died, was buried, and raised again on the third day, and then stop and don't follow through and go on to say what Scripture does say, and that is according to the Scriptures. That, it, that implies everything that Christ accomplished on behalf of His people. I'll say it again, and I've been saying this for a long time. The gospel is what Christ did. That's the good news. The good news, the gospel, is not demanding or insisting or requesting that you do anything. It is the good news of Jesus Christ concerning what He's done. And those who study His book will see what He has done. And most the problem there is, is that with, at least in the minds of most Christians I meet, they don't have a clue as to what Christ has done. In fact, they think that, that, that everything evolves around what they must do. You know, I've spent a lot of time on this channel, uh, hundreds of videos, in fact. I, I believe, trying to explain how the Scripture declares that we're not born again because we accepted Christ. We're not born again because we repented or received or were baptized. We weren't born again because we did anything. We're born again by the will of God. It all began with, let there be light. We're born again because we're His, we're his sheep. John 3.16 does not say if they believe, they won't perish. doesn't say that, folks. It says those who are believers won't perish. That's what it says. It doesn't say they won't perish because they believe. It says, they're, it says they're believers, therefore they won't perish. Why don't you believe me, our Lord said? Because you are not my sheep. What is a believer? It's one of his sheep. If you were my sheep, you'd believe. You don't become a sheep by believing. You believe because you're already one of his sheep. If any man bring any other gospel, let him be accursed. Folks, those are strong words. And we get now to verses 22 and 23. I find these verses very interesting, but I also found these verses to be very difficult to translate. Then on the other hand, uh, when looked at in, in context, they don't seem so difficult really after all. You can read literally hundreds of different translations. I've, I've, I've suggested that there are over 500 English translations alone. So you're stuck with mine. The big argument among Greek scholars is whether there are two or three subjects in these two verses. I happen to think that there are, are, are three. I also happen to think it's talking about the same people, us, not them, but us. And so that will influence the, the way that I translate it. But before I talk about what these verses say, or what I think that they say. I want you to understand that these two verses are the results of these people that we've been looking at. That the Holy, I believe that the Holy Spirit is bring, bringing us into these next two verses as a result of what these people have done. That's, that's what I'm trying to say. The Holy Spirit is not concealing the fact that there is a Re result from those who crept in unawares. People do follow a wandering star. They do get hung up on doctrinal issues, tossed back and forth, unsettled, 
confused, doubting, wavering. The Holy Spirit suddenly seems to break the thought in verse 21, keep yourself in God's love, center your attention in God's Word. But I don't think that He has broken that thought. Most people I talk to who profess to be a Christian don't really know what this book says. I don't know. I don't know how much time that they spend studying it, but it's clear from what they say they don't know what this book says. What I'm going to suggest, folks, is if we're not in verse 21, keeping ourselves in God's love, we're liable to be influenced by these ungodly men who have crept in unaware, who profess to be leaders, but they're wandering stars, who profess to be teaching truth, but what they're teaching are their own personal desires, their own ungodly lusts. You know, there's a tremendous temptation to make that mean something sexual. If a brother be overtaken in a fault, oh, there's a guy, you know, that was unfaithful to his wife or something like that. But what about a doctrinal fault? What about a fault in teaching or understanding God's Word? Isn't that infinitely more important would be my question to you. The interesting thing is that when people do get involved in sinful activity of the flesh, many times we're quick to restore them. You know, we'll call the family together, we'll have a circle meeting, we'll have a intervention, you know, that sort of thing. But when they get involved in doctrinal error, what do we do? We shun them. We don't want anything to do with them. But I believe that the Holy Spirit says, look, there's some doctrinal error in the fellowship because of these ungodly teachers, and you have a responsibility to restore these people. In Galatians chapter 6, we read, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. I want you to take a look at verse 22 and 23. I've, I'm going to throw up here on the screen a comparison between the KJV and the original text. In the KJV, it says, and of some have compassion, making a difference, and others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. The original Greek, however, it reads just a little bit different. And those who are doubting, indeed have mercy on. Also others save out of fire, snatching. Then to others show mercy with fear, even hating the clothing having, having been stained by the flesh. Notice the words there, mercy, in the original text that you don't see in the KJV. And this, and I, you know, I'd love it if all you people that are just KJV only people would take note of this, folks. The KJV, the King James version, and I love it. Okay, I've memorized a lot of it. It is not the original text. It's just a translation, just like any other. Nothing is as close to the original text except the original text. The easy thing would be to excommunicate these folks. Shun them. Kick them out of the fellowship. Don't give them any spiritual support at all. Of course, they could be those that, that actually lead the fellowship, which that's now that's a different subject. It's interesting to me how God doesn't assume a, a a scenario was that. He doesn't even present a scenario was that. We may help people out of a moral situation, but what about a spiritual situation? That guy's teaching error, so I want nothing to do with him. The text says, have mercy on those who waver. That's oscillating between believing this ungodly preacher and what this book says. You know, I, I hear what you say, Steve, but it doesn't quite ring true. That other guy, who you know, the one who speaks great swelling words. Now, him I understand. But, I, but and I'm not really sure. 
You know, maybe he's right. Maybe you're right. Have mercy on those who doubt. Have mercy on those who waver. Some are wavering. They're oscillating between truth and error. I'm to have mercy on these people. They are not these ungodly ones. They are God's children. I believe that the exhortation is that I am to minister the Word of God to them in mercy. Not in hate, not in anger, but in mercy. Someone asked me years ago, Steve, what's the difference between grace and mercy? Mercy is not giving to someone what they deserve. Grace is our receiving from God what we did not deserve. Judgment, wrath, hell. That's grace. Mercy is not receiving what we deserve. Grace is me getting what, what I don't deserve. Mercy is me not getting what I do deserve. That's the difference. Have mercy on those who waver. Some are wavering. Save others by snatching them out of fire. Okay? First of all, the word is saved. Saved. Sozo in the Greek. Now, as far as I'm concerned, and I've suggested this on many occasions, that's the most misused word in Christianity. What does saved mean? It, well, it means you accepted Christ. You're going to heaven. No. Saved means to be delivered. Only God's sheep are delivered. No one else is saved, folks. If someone is saved, it's because they are already his sheep. I've covered this uh, in a number of videos. Already declared righteous because Jesus Christ died in their place. That's the person that when he believes is delivered, but he's already headed for heaven, whether he believes unto salvation or not. Now, that's the, the truth. You have to look at these words in context, folks. Belief doesn't cause new birth. Belief does not bring about justification. Belief does not bring about righteousness. Belief brings deliverance. I'm delivered from the law. I'm delivered from self-effort. I'm delivered from sin, self, the law, the world, Satan, even death. That's deliverance. Belief brings deliverance. Delivered from error. Delivered from fear, worry. Delivered from unrest. But none of those things have to do with redemption. I know I've stated this on, on numerous occasions. Many people are redeemed who will never be saved, delivered. In the, in the sense of, of fruit bearing. In the sense of delivered from sin, self, the law, the world, Satan. They most definitely will be delivered from God's wrath. They'll most definitely be delivered their bodies, the redemption of our body, but even the, 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 our bodies being, re, re, the redemption of our bodies is the word redeemed, not delivered. When you look at the judgment seat of Christ, you see that an, a man's entire life's work can be burned up, yet he himself shall be delivered, that is saved, by that judgment. I've done at least several videos on that subject. This word does not mean preach the gospel to somebody and get them redeemed so that they're going to heaven. That's not what we're looking at here in the text, folks. I'm going to suggest that these people are already going to heaven, every single one of them. Also, others save out of fire snatching. Okay? So here's one who's wavering, and now here's one close to fire. But wait a minute, I thought there was no judgment for those who are in Christ Jesus. Well, there's not. So, well, what's up with the fire? We will all give an account of ourselves before the judgment seat of Christ. 
as to how we built on Christ where there is doctrinal error that goes against the finished work of Christ, there's fire. Well, there's hay, wood, and stubble. The fire will try every man's work. When you preach, when you teach, that which is not biblical, okay? When you live and you walk according in the flesh, according to that which is not spiritual, that's what is going to be burned up, folks. Every man's work will give an account for his life's work. The, work. the word work in the Greek there is singular. That's his entire life's work. That always thrills me as I read that. It isn't works plural. It's his entire life's work. How do you build on wood, hay, and stubble? When we talk about what Christ did, that is gold, silver, precious stone. Wood, hay, and stubble will be burned up. If any man shall suffer loss, yet he'll be delivered, saved, so as by fire. That's the fire that Jude is writing about. Or the Holy Spirit, through Jude, is showing us here. Most Christians I talk to are not concerned about rewards. It's just enough. I don't know how many times I've heard it. Well, it's just enough. If I get to heaven, I hope I make it to heaven. Everybody else, they can have all those rewards. I'll be just absolutely thrilled if I just get to heaven. Well, getting to heaven is based on Jesus Christ dying in your place, not anything that you, that you do. Number one, you had no work in that. You won't be rewarded for that. Guarantee you that. He didn't die in your place because you asked him to. He didn't die in your place because you did something. He either died in your place or he didn't. It's just that simple. We're chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Because Jesus Christ died in your place, in God's eyes, you are spotless, blameless, unreprovable. But what about reward? Now, I don't care about reward. Just the fact I'm going to heaven, well, that's enough. And folks, wouldn't you think that that's, that's sort of slighting God? So we snatch them out of fire. Oh, that in the day of accounting, I might say, Lord, I believed you. I trusted you. I believed your word. I taught your word. Folks, don't you want gold, silver, and precious stone? Do you want to be that close to the fire? Works done in the flesh, law, carnality, spiritual adultery, promoting self as, as opposed to glorifying in and, and boasting in Christ Jesus and having no confidence in the flesh. Yet he himself shall be delivered so as by fire. I don't, I don't question your eternal destiny. I don't question your spending all the years of eternity in heaven with every tear dried up. But is His reward to you, folks, is His reward so inconsequential of such little importance that you don't care? You know, just, just, it's just enough that you, you get there, you make it there, you be there. I can't do that. We are to d deliver others, save others, deliver others that are so close to losing all of that reward. The word snatching out there is the same word that's translated caught up in 1 Thessalonians 4. There's our word harpazo, same word. We shall, we shall be caught up, snatched away. It's the same word. The same way that the Lord is going to snatch us up it's a sudden removal from danger is what the word means. We are to snatch those away from this danger, the danger of doctrinal error. Snatch those away from the fire. Somehow open their eyes to the error, to the foolishness, so that the glory and the honor and the praise might be given Christ. It then goes on to say, Then to others show mercy with fear, that is reverence, respect for God, even hating the clothing, having been stained by the flesh. What clothing? 
the righteousness of Christ that's been imputed unto them through the finished work of Christ. You know, like pouring old wines into new wineskins. Okay? They're, they're involved in doctrinal error. They're walking according to the flesh. They're a new creation in Christ. They, they, they're holy, unblameable, unreprovable in His sight. They've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. They've been clothed with Christ, yet they're involved in everything contrary to that. They're new creations in Christ, living as though they're not. Or that the old man is the dominant factor in their day-to-day -day walk. They don't know who they are. Many of them, they don't even know who they are. They're doubting. They're, ha they're involved in, a, in an identity crisis of great magnitude. They don't even know who they are. Imagine going through your life, folks, as a believer in Christ, beloved, loved, loved by God, blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies, and not even knowing it. Living your whole life doubting, worrying, fearing, you know, living in fear, worry, and doubt. Many Christians are like that. So show mercy with fear, even hating the clothing having been stained by the flesh. Where the old man is the dominant factor in their day-to-day -day walk. They don't, they don't know who they are. They're, having, uh, they're suffering from an identity crisis. But what we're tempted to say is, well, you know, uh, I can't believe that anybody could be that stupid. I can't believe that anybody could be that dumb. You know, so if they're led away by error, well, so be it. You know, they ought to be. It's their fault. They're, their choice. They don't, they don't want to study. Have mercy, the text says. Are you hearing me, folks? Have mercy. You know, I've, I've often been accused of being, Steve, you're just a little too cold, a little too calloused, a little too direct, a little too this, a little too that, a little too distant. I don't know. I've, I've heard all the adjectives. In my heart of hearts, folks, I love you all. I consider my ministry mostly polemical. That, puts, that sets me at odds with most of what modern Christianity is preaching today. And I'm not excluded from the text. This, this pertains to me as well. I can also learn from this. Somebody's always going to say, you know, how do I know whether it's God's child? You know, they're not exactly wearing a sign or they don't have a tattoo. You know, and I think that that's all covered in the, in the expression, have mercy. It doesn't take that long, folks, in discussing something with somebody just how far afield that they've really gone. But unless you try, you'll never do. The word hate there means I hate, detest, love less, esteem less, elevating one, one, one value over another. What is it that we hate or love less or esteem less? The person? No. We love the brother. Hating, <coughs> excuse me, Hating the clothing, having been stained by the flesh. That's what we hate. We esteem that stained garment as less valuable because it is. We don't elevate the value of a stained garment over a garment that is unstained. That's how I read that. It's been stained how? By the flesh. And again, I suggest that the flesh there, that's not talking about going fishing on Sunday or four-wheeling, okay, on Sunday. But first and foremost, doctrinal error. Doctrinal error precedes moral error. It always has. So it's about wavering 
as it concerns doctrine which results in an identity crisis and a potential loss of reward. Once again, Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. The word overtaken means to be caught. The word fault means a false step. Spiritual means not carnal, fleshly, law. Restore means to repair or adjust. That's what the word means. And meekness means gentleness. And tempted means tested or tried. Well, we're almost to the end of this wonderful little epistle. I love you all. I truly do. And I thank you for all of your prayers, all of your encouragement, your messages, your emails, all of your support. I love each one and every one of you. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.